Hello and welcome to Disc Review, the podcast that goes track by track through a different album each week. And we're your hosts, Max and Matt. Join us as we explore some of our favorite records. No, I'm a fan, I swear, I swear. I, I feel like I've become a music normie. I'm tired of being Mr. Positive Guy. Dude, it's, that's not you. This is certifiably the most boring album I've ever heard. Uh, I mean, there's a reason they don't do it, because it's terrible. We hope you enjoy the show. Let's get into it. Hello everyone, thank you for coming back and joining us for another episode of Disc Review. Today, we're going to be talking about Take the Sadness Out of Saturday Night by Bleachers, an album which Matt picked. Um, Matt, why did you decide to pick this album this week? Well, it's been an artist I've liked for a long time. I think there's a lot of great records. I don't know why I chose the most recent one. Usually we start at the beginning with an artist, but we're going to be working backwards, I, I think, with this artist this is bleachers this is jack antonoff's kind of solo project the name he uses for his music he's a big producer he's produced for a ton of artists i'm sure a lot of people know you know he's worked with taylor swift lord and most recently the newest 1975 album and as someone who's listened to a lot of his music i could definitely tell you know that he was there on the production you he has a lot of little things that he does and that i think is really unique and makes his songs sound really cool and this is another really well produced album it's a little different sounding and i think we'll talk about it it's got a very unique sound i don't know if you um, picked up on that yeah well i definitely noticed the 1975 sound in there in fact i wrote in my notes a few times here about songs that particularly stood out to me as uh, sounding like the 1975 but yeah this was my first time listening through this album first time ever listening to bleachers so you know it's always good to get into a new artist to Uh, try something new it's definitely not the type of music I typically listen to and I think it's good to branch out and uh and yeah just expand the horizons a little bit um before we get started here I wanted to mention that um we have recently put our podcast on uh, google podcasts and iHeartRadio. so if those work better for you guys go follow us over there Um, listen to whatever on whatever platform is most comfortable for you. I'm trying to get it on more platforms. Um, it's kind of a hassle to be honest, but we're working through that. Um, Matt, what did you think about this album art here? I mean, it's got a very vintage look, right? Film grainy. It's just a picture of himself, probably, you know, playing music. It kind of, to me, looks like he's playing a live show, which I think goes really well with the sound of this record there's a lot of songs and i'll talk about which ones i think are this way but kind of sound like he's playing live music and, and there's a whole room full of people kind of jamming out and i think i think the album art just kind of lends itself to that a little bit it's got some fancy you know font for the album title i think it's pretty minimal but solid yeah it definitely reminds me of like old record covers that you yeah. see when like i don't know if you've ever gone to like a thrift store and looked through their records um, it's very much like it's, that it's type of style. Looking, yeah. Which, I think yeah, it's, it's very purpose. vintage looking. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think it's bad. It's uh, not super interesting to me, but I don't think it's trying to be anything uh, super crazy. Yeah. Jumping into the track by track. Well, the first track is 91. This is the first of two songs on the record named after numbers. Um, it has a very classical orchestra feel and lots of violins and cellos and stuff. The song gives off a sort of sad memories vibe where you kind of remember childhood without the rose colored glasses for the first time. Um, It also kind of goes back and forth with how everything is different now, yet somehow it's all the same. Yeah, I think that a lot of his songs and if you listen to more of his work has that kind of nostalgic feel with um, the lyrics. A lot of them are kind of like introspective, sometimes a little rambling. That's kind of how I feel about this song. It's a lot of openers are this way where it's kind of loose in its song structure and just kind of goes on and just gets you used to the sound. And I think that's what this does well and why I think it works well as an intro. It just establishes that tone and the style um, going forward. You know, it's not, this isn't the most standout track on the record, but it's a really solid start and kind of gets you used to the themes as well. Like you said, with everything changing and um, looking back at a place that's changed I think is a theme that comes up a lot of times from a little bit of research. It seemed like this was a lot of this record was him talking about moving out of his hometown and those feelings that come along with that 
I think kind of inspired this song. The second track is Chinatown featuring Bruce Springsteen. I find the instrumental of this song to be really calming and enjoyable. The vocals are very stylized and pushed to the background with reverb, which is not really uh, my typical style of vocals. I usually like them to be right up front and center so you can easily tell what they're saying. Um, it's not bad. It's just not really my uh, the style I'm I'm used to hearing. Yeah, I mean, I agree. Like, I'm also of that same opinion. And he's done, you know, the more typical vocals right up front on the first two records he did. So I think this was a stylistic choice for this album. I don't think this is like he's always going to do this. But I agree. I remember hearing this track first since it's the lead single and being like, wow, it just sounds a little bit washed out. Like, it's it's kind of weird sounding and that's absolutely why those vocals are not front and center. They feel pushed back and drowned out in reverb. And I think the part, you know, I like about that choice is just how easy it is to get lost on a lot of these songs. And this is the first one where you could just like have this on and it's like you said, it's calming. It's just, you can just get lost in it and it's got a great atmosphere. And I think that's what he goes for on a lot of these tracks, but this one specifically, right. It's, it's kind of the, you know, big bombastic lead single. It's got that, you know, feature from a really big artist, Bruce Springsteen. And I think why I think this song works is just the emotion that they put behind the vocals. I just think they sell it on this one. I don't think they phone it in. The vocals are really good. And, you know, sometimes his lyrics are a little bit cryptic, but, and I'm not saying I understand what this song means or is trying to say, but I can feel that emotion. And I think, that's why it works. Yeah, in a lot of these songs, I was kind of struggling to figure out what he was talking about because his lyrics are kind of very all over the place. And I'm sure to him, you know, they're connected subtly. Um, for for me, like first time listening, I, I was kind of confused on a lot of them. Uh, but I, I think that's kind of also a plus, you know, like songs that you can just figure out over time what it means to you i think that's that's really important um i i obviously bruce springsteen is a a popular artist but i'm not really familiar with his work are you well i've just all the classic 80s songs that pop on the radio i'm not into like deep cuts or anything he's a little bit before our time and i don't blame you for not being super familiar with him but i'm guaranteed you've heard you know very popular songs of his Born in the yeah, USA, probably, Dancing yeah. in the Dark. I mean, I'm sure you've heard them. They're big radio hits and have been around for a while. I think this was another way of him just like tapping into that nostalgia, which he does a lot on his songs. And I kind of feel like that's why he chose a feature like this. The third track is How Dare You Want More. This song, just the way it sung, uh, reminded me a lot of the 1975. I thought that the vocal patterns and the styles were very similar it's uh got a fun happy sounding tune with interesting lyrics it's the kind of song that just keeps going full force and never really lets up yeah i mean a lot of his songs i feel he's just trying to have fun and let you have fun listening to it you know he's not caught up in oh i gotta make this one genre this one style and it's got to have all these elements he just kind of has fun with the production and feel focuses on how that song makes you feel listening to it And you're definitely getting a different experience out of this. Like we talked about the lyrics, you know, even if you're a big Bleachers fan, you're getting into the deep cuts and you're trying to find meaning. I've listened to this album plenty of times and I don't really find any meaning for most of the lyrics. I don't think that that's really what he's going for or what he cares about. And I don't think his audience really cares about that either. And you just kind of have fun with the way it sounds. And I think this one steals the show for me on that. The production is so good. What he's going for, right? Is this is the one I'm talking about where it just feels like you're in a room with live music and it's just like everybody's partying and jamming along. The the way the instruments are put into the track, it just doesn't feel like a studio performance as much. Obviously, it is, but I don't know. Do you get that feeling? Um, this one definitely made me think more of like it. It kind of sounded um, a little looser. Yeah, not as tight but kind of on purpose, kind of just to be like, you know, we just want to have fun here. We just want to do something that's enjoyable for us. Yeah. So that's, that's what I got from that. I just, 
I like a lot of other parts about it. There's a section where like the guitar and the horns just like take turns playing against each other. You know what I mean? That kind of that feels like something mm-hmm. you'd hear in a live show. And then um, when the horn um, starts going a little crazy and then picks it up into a solo, there's like he's in the background singing along to it. That same melody. I just feel like those little things elevate the song from there. Then we have Big Life. This song is about exactly what the title says, being after a big, extravagant, and adventurous life. Some of the vocals in this song are so bizarre to me that I don't even know how he is making that sound with his mouth. You probably know like the parts that I'm talking about. but Like the falsetto part? Yeah, yeah. he's like going so high with it and like uh, almost cracking the his voice. Um, but I don't know. It, I thought it was really interesting. Yeah, this song... Kind of continues that same style for me from that last track. And yeah, the most fun parts for me are that falsetto. And I like how he he does this part where like repeats big, 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 big over and like the drums kick along to it. And I just feel like he keeps that energy going really well throughout the whole track because it is also a little chaotic too, just like the last one. The next song is Secret Life featuring Lana Del Rey. First of all, I love Lana Del Rey. She is like my guilty pleasure. Mm -hmm. I think her voice is so pretty and uh, she just has such a fun attitude about her. This song is probably um, the saddest sounding so far and it's a little softer than some of the other songs we've heard at this point. I think the song has one of the best choruses on the album. It's really simple but very memorable for me. Yeah, I felt like this was, you know, a chance to have more typical song structure. It's more... Simple, like you said, but it's you can still just get lost in this one. And I'm glad that he kind of has a little bit of everything on this record. It's not all just this chaotic, you know, crazy sounding stuff. This is more typical for, you know, a pop artist like this. And I think it has a good place on the record. Now we have Stop Making This Hurt. This song has the most iconic and memorable instrumental to me. That piano part yeah. is just really catchy. Um, the chorus is great when he yells, stop making this hurt. This is another one that sounds a lot like the 1975 to me. Yeah, this is my, I think my pick for the standout pop track. It's so much fun. And like you said, it is, it is really catchy. I always jam out to this one. I, I think it's fun to just get lost. I love the way he uses yelling a lot in his, you know, it, it's not, doesn't feel like he's yelling, but he's just singing it so loud and forcefully and with such energy, I you just can't help but get lost in it. Now we have Don't Go Dark. I like the little chimes in the background of this one. Uh, this song is my favorite on the album, I think. It's got a good flow to it with enjoyable lyrics. Uh, I think I kind of have an idea, but I wanted to get your opinion on this. What does it mean to go dark on someone? Yeah, because he uses that. I don't know how much you were looking at the lyrics, but there's some other songs where he uses going dark and light and dark as themes. I don't know. I mean, if I'm going to take it at face value, it means um, going distant, going cold, you know, uh, turning your back on someone. Is that kind of what you got for you getting a different message? No, yeah, that's that's kind of what I was thinking. I, I also saw that he used the, the phrase going dark on one of the other songs, and mm-hmm. I, I think that it's one of the consistent themes throughout this record is um, kind of relating to other people yeah. and how difficult that can really be and how quickly someone can kind of just, uh, you know, you could be so close and then all of a sudden you're so far away. Yeah, I agree. I think that... For as cryptic as the lyrics are, there definitely are some running themes that you can that you can get on this record, and I think have fun with that. The next track is 45, which is my personal favorite. I It's pretty, you know, it's a simple acoustic song, but what it's got is a very catchy chorus with a lot of emotion, and these lyrics you can relate emotionally to, I think, the easiest. I think it is more clear what it's about. And I just, I think it's a great listen. Yeah, I mean, here we have the other song that's named after a number. Um, I, I love a good acoustic song, and especially a love acoustic song. I love the line, now you're just a stranger that I know best. Mm-hmm. Um, that kind of goes back to the the going dark, where it's like, um, you know, I know you, but I feel like we're strangers. Um, and I just like that that imagery, that, that um, 
idea. I like when people play around with the concept of what it means to know a person. The next song is Strange Behavior. This song has the best vocals on the album for me. This is um, this and the next track are the only songs where they kind of drop the vocal effects and just have a somewhat raw voice. This is more of the style of vocals that I'm used to. Um, I just think it's more clear and simple and sounds like you're just in a room with someone as they sing a song. So I don't know. I'd be interesting. I'd, I'd be interested to see what the album sounded like if all of the songs were like this. But I know that it was a stylistic choice they made, and that's totally fine. Yeah, I get that same feeling too. This is one of the most personal and intimate tracks. I think this next song is kind of of the same quality. I mean, these songs slow way down, and you just get a really personal look. And yeah, I mean, I don't. These songs they make me feel sad. They are sad. The last song is What I Do With All This Faith. This is the closer to the album. It has an intro at the beginning that's it's like a minute long. I probably would have shortened that if it was up to me, but I get that sometimes with the last song, you want to make it as like theatrical and emotional as possible. So I get why they did it that way. This is another one of my favorites here. Um, I, I kind of struggled to understand the lyrics. Um, it was another one where... I felt like it was a little bit all over the place um, and maybe people who have listened to it more got more of a clear cut message. But uh, what did you think about it? I think this one continues that same theme. He's talking about, you know, his, I feel like he gets more hometown vibes. And then he also talks, this is a theme I noticed a lot. He keeps talking about coast to talk about West coast or East coast. He mentions that again. I think, Mm -hmm. I don't know. I wonder if it's kind of, I, I was, he's from the East Coast, from New Jersey specifically, and I think he's moved around. You know, obviously he's a big part of the music industry, which takes part a lot in LA and the West Coast, and probably moving around. Just kind of, this is kind of his thoughts and feelings on it. You know, I'm not entirely sure, kind of the conclusion, but it's just another song to get lost in. I think that this is another really kind of somber melancholy sounding song i don't know what he's using the term faith for specifically i don't really understand that part of the song and maybe any diehard bleachers fans that have figured that out drop in the comments below i'd love to hear all right well that's all the tracks here um what what are you thinking about this album now that we've gone through it track by track well i'm you know i'm a bleachers fan i think that his second record is still my favorite but I like the chances that this album takes and there's still some really great standout songs that you know add a lot to the Bleacher, Bleacher's catalog. I put this one on frequently. It's a great album if you want a very stylized record that's cohesive and you can, if you enjoy this sound, I think you'll like it a lot. It's It's very specific to what it is, but if you're a big Bleacher, if you want to know more about Bleachers, I think a second record is the best, and I'm sure we'll review it soon. Yeah, I think that this record is definitely different from anything else we've reviewed on this channel. We've talked about the 1975, which definitely has similar aspects to it, but this is kind of something all on its own. Um, I think that it tried things that are not very um, common in the music industry, especially in pop, um, which is kind of just to branch out and do something little a little different, a little uh, out of the ordinary. And, you know, I think in some places it landed really well. In some places it wasn't my favorite choice, but I like that it was something different. And that's kind of all you can hope for these days is something that'll be just a little bit different from what you've heard before. Yeah, I mean, we're always going to critique boring, generic, blind albums the most. And if you take a chance, you're already winning points in my book. And at that point, it's kind of just up to personal preference if you liked it or not, but at least you're doing something. And for some people, it works really well. Some people, it doesn't. But I always want to see more creativity, and I think Bleachers is putting that in full force, and I'm really happy with that. All right, you guys. Well, thank you for sticking around and listening to this review of um, the Bleachers album. We're grateful for all of you who have stuck around and, uh, you know, helped us build this community. We hope that we can um, get to know you better. We hope that we can, uh, you know, serve you and bring you content that you enjoy. Uh, Share this with a friend. Share it with uh, someone you think appreciates music like you do. 
and uh, we'll see you next week on another review.